versus Clarence Shockey. That's case number 29170. The state has waived oral argument in this matter, so we will just be hearing from Attorney Bendick on behalf of Mr. Shockey. Uh, the court has read the briefs and we are ready to proceed. If you are, you'll have 15 minutes, of course. Thank you. Is our clock working okay on the screen now? It should be, Judge. Okay, so keep track up there as well. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, I am Alan Medvick. I represent the defendant and father in this matter, Clarence Shockey. Um, Mr. Shockey was uh, convicted of kind of sexual battery. Um, the section of that code that he was convicted of, um, in my reading, is strict liability um, code that has no concerns about consent or about the age of the uh, of the alleged victim in the case, and in that case, meaning that if this was a, a claim of, of having sexual relationship with his biological daughter, um, and would not matter if she was 17 or 47, we believe that is still an act of sexual battery under Ohio law. Um, the issues on appeal here concern the sexual registration requirement that was imposed Mr. Shockey. Uh, he was found to be a tier three sex offender based on section uh, um, chapter 2950 of the Iowa Revised Code. Um, the two assignments of error raised concern the uh, finding and the amendment of the complaint, uh, the amendment of the charge without re-indictment to change the date range which from a date range in which the uh, alleged child, alleged victim, was clearly an adult at the time of the offense to a date range which encompassed the period of time when she was 17 years old and considered a minor. Um, that amendment significantly changed the penalties that Mr. Shockey faced, that he uh, went from having no sexual registration requirements as a sex offender at all to being a tier three lifetime reporter um, after the term of incarceration should conclude. So the- It changed the penalty. Did it change the name or identity of the, the offense? And this is the, the state's argument that there's some conflation between name and identity. Those are two distinct aspects. Name, the name of the charge is the name of the charge. The identity is defined as a change in penalty. That is very clear, the increase in penalty is an increase, is a change of the identity of the offense. The case law is clear on that. That is a, that conflation is, is simply misrepresented by the state. They are, there, there are two distinct elements here. Yes, the charge is sexual battery, but the penalty that my client is facing is a, an increase and that is, um, and that is true, it would be akin to an increase in the level of the offense from say a, a, a felony three to a felony two that the, the law on that is clear that that would require re, re indictment of course in this case the same charge. did it change the level of the offense or did it, it just change the it did not but to that point uh the, the state also argues that there's no authority to claim that while they admit that the sexual offender registration is a penalty they, they seem to claim that it is some kind of penalty outside the scope of the criminal punishment. Uh, the Williams case is clear, not just in the cited language in my brief, that this is a um, this is a criminal penalty, but also in the paragraph before that, in paragraph 15, and this is the Williams case, 2011, Ohio 3374, that regarding the sexual report, sexual offender reporting requirements, these restraints in li on liberty are the consequences of specific criminal convictions and should be recognized as part of the punishment that is imposed as a result of the offender's actions. This Ohio Supreme Court, in the Williams case, declared that sexual offender requirements are penalty related directly to the offense indicted and charged and convicted. So to, to claim that this is somehow outside, that the sexual offender registration is not a penalty that would require re-indictment in this case is, um, is it simply wrong. Um, I don't like to say something that bold as a lawyer, but um, in this case, that's clearly a misrepresentation and not the state of the law. The Williams case out of the Ohio Supreme Court is the authority that states that. Um, the 
state wants to characterize this as a as an amendment to correct a, a date error, a typographical error. Whether that is accurate or not, um, whether that is true, what what it did do was correct an error that changed this from being an offense without with a significantly lower penalty. Um, and I'm not saying that a five year prison sentence is, is not significant, but it imposed a lifetime reporting requirement when there would have been none at all and no period of time in which Mr. Chalky would have been identified as a sexual offender to having a lifetime of reporting. The Ohio State has, Supreme Court has declared that that is, is a criminal punishment. This would be akin to changing the law and going back and, re, and resentencing him. Um, and that is essentially what the Williams case says you cannot do. Um, this was a, a, definitely falls within the plain error doctrine. It would be a deviation from the law that is obvious in the reading of the law and that would affect a substantial right. Um, my client's punishments are significantly greater than they would have been but for this error. Um, and if they would have gone back and re-indicted the case, no problems? If they had gone back and re-indicted, it would have, and I am not speaking to, to trial counsel's approach, but with this change of date, and this is the, obviously, as the state indicates, in most cases, a, a date change, a specific date is not a requirement right. for an indictment. But in this case, and as stated, the exceptions to that are when it would change, when the change in the identity of, of those dates would change how the prosecute, how the defendant would approach their case, how they would pursue this um, defense. And in this case, I think having changed that date, it changed how the defendant would have approached that case because I think right now you have a window where across the board, I think and in reading that case, I don't know that they were looking at trying to establish is there when this sort of, occurred. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Is there some sort of trial strategy argument that could be made here since, I since believe, the dates were in the medical records and maybe he just wanted to get his Because case you're right? in that window, I believe that, and this gets to the second point where I don't believe that it was established or that certainly the, the trial judge did not state specifically that she had, that, that the child was, a, that the victim was a child at the time of the offense. Um, that's the assignment of error two, that there was no finding of, in the record of the time of the offense and that the, that, the child, that the victim was a minor at the time of the offense. And I think that that would have changed the defense strategy that more time would have been spent in establishing, in attempting to establish that this, that the state could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt at what age this act occurred. Um, I think there's testimony, but there is not cross-examination. It's clear in the transcript um, the registration was a concern for Mr. Shockey, that in, in fact there were plea negotiations, and in the record he states that he did not want the registration, and that's why he did not accept the plea as presented. Um, so I do think that it would have changed the strategy. I think it could have, um, and if my guess is that, um, and I'm not trying to impede trial counsel, uh, is that none of the uh, parties at the trial, the prosecutor, um, the judge, or the um, defense counsel were aware of this exception. Um, I think that's how this slipped by, but it's clear in the record, it is obvious as written that, that this is an exception. And I think it's specifically written for this offense in sexual battery cases involving consensual acts between adults. And, um, and in this case, um, because it's brought as sexual battery, there is no claim, there is no element of consent that had to be proven or that was proven. There, there's no evidence of that in the record that this was not a consensual act. I'm not speaking to that. It's not there. It's not something that was proven by the state. Um, so to that end, that is why I'm, I'm arguing that, that the sexual battery, that the sexual reporting requirement was an error, that the amendment of the indictment was an error to include that, um, the plain error, and that it affected a substantial right to my client. Whose burden would it be to prove that it's not consensual states? 
What's that? Is it the state's burden to prove it's not consensual? Or it would be the defendant's burden to prove it is consensual. It would absolutely be the state's burden. This is a criminal punishment. Um, all elements of, of criminal punishment would need to be shown beyond a reasonable doubt by the state. That I, I think he would need to be found guilty of that element, and that I think that that would need to be stated in the record and be found and proven by the trier of fact uh, and acknowledged. And I think that, that is absent from the record as well. And that's and as brought here, um, as I said, sexual battery has no consent element. It is presumed to be. Um, and there was no later finding, there was no later consideration, no separate sexual offender hearing if the, if, to determine if it, and I'm not sure that that would be appropriate or how you go about that, but there's no evidence submitted whether the act was consensual or whether the act was at a time when the child was a child. Um, and the, uh, and I would contend that the state's argument on appeal that the amendment to correct a typographical error um, seems facile, uh, particularly because they, the date in the record was um, the, the origin, as originally indicted was clearly just outside of her eight, just past her 18th birthday to correct that backward. Um, I think was done with the knowledge that it would impute the sexual offender requirements and that that was not reindicted and that did not result in the necessary acts, I think is plain error to the detriment of the court. Did the court make any finding that the typographical error was correct? I don't believe that they did. I think that they simply asked, I think uh, the trial prosecutor asked that it be amended um, to reflect the record, but did not ask that it be resubmitted. I don't know that it's identified as a typographical error. And it may be to correct facts as they receive the medical records, but that would require the indictment in this instance. Either way, because I think it changes the identity of the case. And we're playing error on both of these assignments because there's no objection and no request for I saw no objection. Um, uh, the usual standard for a an amendment for allowing an amendment without indictment is abuse of discretion. Um, but there was no objection at the trial level to this, so I argued this as plain error. Um, I think it fits within plain error, um, and I think it, it was plain error. Did you really have an argument ineffective assistance of counsel? I have not. Um, I. No. Um, That's fine. I was just yeah. And I don't know that the, <laughs> we're here now. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's just a matter of you're saying that it's prejudice. You have to show prejudice. It is. And I, I think that you're right. And that's a, it's a thin line um, between prejudice and ineffective assistance. Um, but I, I think that this falls within plain error. Uh, yeah. I would ask this court to uh, reverse based on that. Is there any significance to the fact that if he does not comply with the central registration requirements, there are additional yes, charges that could be brought? Absolutely. And I, I believe that that is how we got where we are today in the Williams case. And that that's why this is a, a clear restraint on liberty and a clear additional criminal punishment that he would not have faced but for the amendment of this indictment. That right now he has a lifetime reporting requirement that, that will result in additional felonies if he does not comply with those requirements. And potentially in additional time in in prison. I think that, that it's a significant penalty. And that is why we've reached a point where the state Supreme Court has recognized after some slow rolling to get there that these are uh, in fact criminal punishments, not a civil statute. Apart and separate. And if there are no further questions, I will concede the balance of my time. Of 45 seconds. <laughs> Any questions? All right, thank you very much for your argument. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a decision in due course, which will be mailed to you on the day of its release. And you can also keep your eye on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website where the opinions are posted.